we, we got to find a way forward, though, because you can't just bury your head in the sand or you can't just say, oh, let's become Luddites and, you know, who needs all this social media? Look at here, the two of us, we're on a screen. I mean, so I get it. And we can and should use all this wonderful technology. And it can indeed be a way of reaching out and establishing connection, but it can't be an end in itself. It can't be the whole world you're in. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. We're in the midst of a mental health crisis, many calling it another pandemic. Record high numbers of Americans are facing depression and suicide. Almost half of young people report feelings of persistent sadness and depression. What's behind this crisis and how can the church help? That's what we'll be discussing today with Bishop Barron. Joining us from our studio in Rochester, Minnesota, Bishop, always delightful to see you. Hey, Brandon, good morning. How are you and the family doing down there in Orlando? Yeah, we're doing very well. Very <laughs> well. Everyone's back in school after the long break, so we're good. chugging along well. Good. Before we get to mental health, I want to talk about a related ethical issue. It's one that you raised at the recent USCCB conference. That's the gathering of all the American bishops. And in your role as head of the Bishops Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth, you gave uh, a, a statement on behalf of the U.S. bishops concerning the practice of surrogacy. Uh, tell us about that. What prompted it? Maybe what is surrogacy and, and why do the bishops see problems with it? Well, I was just echoing the Pope. So the Pope made a strong statement against surrogacy. And then in my capacity as chair, I, I wanted to, you know, show the U.S. bishops support for that. You know, so surrogacy that might be the, the use of, a, of another woman to, uh, you know, give a, another couple a child. So it's a kind of a instrumentalizing of the womb of one woman for the sake of another. Um, the problem the church has, it's under the rubric of, of ends and means. You know, a couple wants to have a child, good. Another person wants to help them and encourage them in, their, in having a child. But those good ends don't justify the means. Surrogacy involves a breakdown, call it of the inner logic of the sexual act. The church looks at that in a very integrated way. The sexual act involving a psychological dimension, a spiritual dimension, a physical dimension. And it has a, an internal logic. So we say that Sex is appropriate within the context of a married, a married commitment and the couple's open to life. Um, when we break up that inner logic in different ways, and surrogacy does it in a very dramatic way, and the Pope used that language of instrumentalizing um, uh, sexuality, uh, we're in very murky and very dangerous moral territory. So we just wanted to confirm uh, what the Pope said and to show our support for it, because I it's part, Brandon, as you know, of a general kind of meltdown, morally speaking, where there's a lot of, of end justifying the means language going on. If someone wants a good thing and they have good feelings about it and it really is a good thing, well, then whatever you need to do, you should be able to do it. And the church has always backed away from that. If you were to say, hey, look, it's, it's a good end to uh, defend my country against its enemies. Well, therefore, let's drop an atomic bomb on every enemy city. Well, no, the end does not justify the means. So in a similar way with surrogacy, um, it's a very problematic moral situation. And the good end of, of having a child doesn't justify it. Let's move from one ethical moral problem to another. Uh, I want to spend the rest of this episode talking about this mental health crisis that's overtaken our country. I mentioned how at the recent November meeting of the bishops, you led a presentation and then a discussion among the bishops about the mental health crisis. Uh, first of all, wh why did the bishops even put this on the agenda? Why do you think they feel so strongly that this is a pressing issue for them? Well, I suggested it when I became chair of this committee you mentioned, the Lady Marriage, Youth, and Family Life Committee. Uh, when I became chair, I said, you know, my predecessor, Archbishop Corleone, had done a lot of wonderful work in terms of laying out the church's teaching on, on sexuality and marriage. So I said, that's terrific. An issue that strikes me as very important now is this mental health crisis. And I've been following it because of my interest in, in young people and reaching out to the secular world that so many studies have shown that there's a spiking number uh, of people with depression and anxiety and suicidal uh, ideation, and especially among the young. 
So I said to my committee, I, I think this is something we should talk about. So my committee worked on it and our staff worked on it. And we decided to make a presentation to the body. And it was simply meant to be a kind of introduction to the fact that we're going to have roundtables around the country discussing the issue, right? Bringing pastoral and, and clinical and spiritual people together. So I really anticipated I'd be up there with Archbishop Gudziak, by the way, who was the co-sponsor of it, that we'd be up there for five minutes and make this announcement and get some polite applause and we'd sit down. Um, we were there for an hour. And it was, I think it's fair to say, the, the most energy uh, that the bishop showed during that whole uh, meeting, uh, one after another, getting up to the microphone to say, you know, yes, this is a crisis and yes, we have to do something and here's what we've done and here are our, our problems we faced. And... It was very um, illuminating, and um, we are indeed following up on that. And um, I think in March is the first of these uh, roundtables. So that's where it came from. It was really from my uh, suggestion that we look at this matter. I want to talk about some of the themes and patterns that arose during these discussions and interventions from the bishops. One of the ones that came immediate to the fore was social media. Probably yeah. no surprise to most people here. Many researchers have linked the rise of social media with the rise of mental health issues. How do you see this correlation? How does social media lead to damaged mental health? In a lot of ways. It first came on my, my radar screen many years ago when I, I read Gene Twenge's book, uh, iGen. And we've referenced that a couple of times. I'm not sure how old that book is, at least five years probably, right? Um, probably longer. Time goes by so fast. But she, in that study of, of the, we call them, well, I don't know if it's Gen Z anymore or what, but I mean, the, the really young kids. Uh, she said there's a tight correlation between screen time and depression. And I never really thought about that before. Even though, even though once I read it, I thought, yeah, I kind of feel that. I, I know that when I've been, for whatever reason, spending too much time with screens, whether it's working on my computer or the stupid, you know, uh, iPhone, uh, it, it is depressing. You know? And now you've got a generation that has been so conditioned by it. I, I think, Brandon, it's a function of that incurvatus in se problem of the turning in on oneself. It's a, it's a, how about getting lost in the virtual world, not the real world. And there's something alienating about that when I'm not in touch with reality. Next, I would say it's the loss of real social contact. What makes us happy? We're, we're built for happiness. And what makes us happy is connecting to each other. Uh, you know, body, soul, mind, emotion, et cetera. When we reach out and we make a real connection to somebody, that's what makes us happy. So if we have these devices now that that um, are repugnant to that, of course it's going to cause greater depression. Another feature, of course, we're well aware of this, how brutal the social media world is. In the beginning, oh, this is wonderful. We just will connect with each other and share information. And yeah, it sounded great. And all that's true. But then it's accompanied by these brutal attacks in, in you know, com boxes and then whatever. And especially for young people, if that's the world you've grown up with, that's the world you primarily live in, and it's you're flooded with negativity. Another step, you know, many have pointed out, um, go to Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, and people will post themselves at their best. You know, I'll take 50 selfies and choose the very best one to put up on social media. I'll show the best time I'm having with my friends on Instagram. And here's a TikTok showing how wonderfully happy my friends and I are. So people look at that and then they say, well, I mean, life isn't like that. We have good days and bad days. And, but you look at that world and you think, all these people, look at them. They're all beautiful. They're all happy. They're all successful. And, and here I am in my room, and I'm I'm not successful, and I'm not connected, and I'm not that beautiful. Well, look at nobody is. You know, we're all in the same boat here. We're you know, we're in a world that's both good and bad. But social media can give the impression that I'm surrounded by beautiful, joyful people. So what what's the matter with me? So I'm scratching the surface here, but some of the reasons why social media can lead, especially in kids, to uh, anxiety and depression. You mentioned in your litany of issues with social media, the fact that we're not made to be isolated from other people. And this was another 
pattern that came up among the bishops yeah. is the connection between especially COVID period, post COVID period, the isolation many people faced and declining yeah. mental health. Can you talk about that? Why is it that community is so central to having a healthy mental state? We're, we're built for love. You know, we're built to go out of ourselves. Uh, God is love. And so the very ground of being is something like relationship. And we're designed for that. Um, it's moving out of oneself, forgetting oneself, and moving into higher and richer forms of existence. That's the way to look at it. Love is not a sentimental um, state of mind. Love is a kind of metaphysical attitude that I, I break free of the black hole of my own self-preoccupation so that I can now immerse myself in, in the real. So when I'm, I'm talking to you and entering into your world and, and showing a concern for you and so on, my world's expanded. Right? I, a new dimension of being has opened up to me. And now more and more and more I go out, even says the Lord, loving our enemies, because that's the trajectory of the human spirit is away from the incurvatus and say out. So that's why connection and relationship are so important. Do you, Brandon, now your, your own kids are, you know, growing up in this world too. Something I find interesting, they talk about the really young kids are afraid of the phone. <laughs> the phone rings and I don't want to answer the phone. Or, or there's a knock on the door and everyone's petrified. And I've got a job interview. I, I, I don't want to deal with that because they're so used to mediating reality through the screens, right? So when a re real person arrives, whether it's over f the phone or at the door, at their, is, do you find that to be true? I've, I've certainly read about that. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it, especially with uh, the high schoolers I work with, the yeah. middle schoolers I work with. Because when, when you're talking with someone in person, there's a whole new slew of things things to consider, yes. body language and manners yes. and unspoken communication, whereas like a text message is pretty straightforward and right. you can really carefully craft it and get it just right. But the unpredictability of a real life interaction is scary to a lot of people. Yeah. And, and you're right. That's a, a point that uh, Gene Twenge makes is just all the subtle picking up on cues and as you say, body language and social cues and so on. And that's a real art. And you, you learn that by interacting with people. Um, so that's another problem with it. Uh, we we got to find a way forward, though, because you can't just bury your head in the sand or you can't just say, oh, let's become Luddites and, you know, who needs all this social media? Look at here, the two of us, we're on a screen. <laughs> and so I get it. And we can and should use all this wonderful technology. And it can indeed be a way of reaching out and establishing connection. But it can't be an end in itself. It can't be the whole world you're in. So we have to find the right way. And I, I hope the church can provide some instruction there for people, help them see the way through that. I think one unique way that the church can help here is by emphasizing a more comprehensive understanding of mental health. This is mm -hmm. something you brought up in your presentation, the connection between mental health and spiritual health. I think here of Carl Jung, the yeah. 20th century analytical psychologist, and he said, at bottom, Every psychological problem is a spiritual problem. Do you agree with that? I do. I remember the first time I read that many, many years ago in Jung, and I thought, yep, that's right. And Jung, that was born of a lot of clinical experience. That wasn't just uh, off the top of his head. That was dealing with real patients over many, many decades. And, you know, for Jung, Jung would put that in his own framework, but I, I, think it's, um, I think it's dead right. Because he finally, Brandon, it has to do with our relationship to what Tillich would call ultimate concern, our relationship to the summum bonum, the highest good. Um, the spiritual tradition has long known that the greatest source of human suffering is idolatry, is false worship. When I've ordered my life to something less than God, and that will lead necessarily to suffering. And so it might manifest itself at the psychological level. You know, I'm experiencing anxiety or depression or whatever it is. Well, keep following that all the way all the way to the roots. Now, look at someone like Dante. You know, Dante, the Divine Comedy, begins with someone in a psychological crisis. I, I woke to find myself alone and lost in the dark wood, having wandered from the straight path. And even to think of that time fills me with, with uh, fear. Well, there, that's where a lot of people are today, right? Well, what does Dante do under God's guidance, ultimately, is he goes all the way down 
to find the source of his alienation and suffering. And what he finds is um, Satan. Now, what does Satan stand for there? Bad worship. He's the inverse of God, right? He's at the very bottom. He's stuck in the ice, curvatus in se. He's got the three faces, which are kind of a crude imitation of the three persons of the Trinity. So he stands for forms of false worship. And Dante's got to go all the way down. Now, there's Jung. At bottom, all of our psychological problems are spiritual problems, right? And so we need psychologists to be sure, but we also need soul doctors. This goes back to the very beginning of my publishing career. One of the very first articles I ever published was a priest as mystagogue and priest as soul doctor. Um, Cura animarum, the care of souls. That's what a priest is, is concerned with. Is there a psychological dimension? Yes, and that's often how the problem will manifest itself. But then who talks about the deepest issues of the soul? And that's where the priest comes in. He's a curate, we used to say, uh, cura animarum. He's a doctor of souls, doctor animarum. So um, that's all in support of Jung's statement. Yeah, I think at bottom, all, sp- all psychological problems are spiritual. I'd like to connect Jung's insight to something we've discussed ad nauseum here, which is the rise of the nuns. If, yeah. if every psychological problem is ultimately a spiritual problem, and we have this increasing drift away from religion, do you, do you connect that fact to the decline in mental health? How can you not? And, and that seems so obvious to me. Um, if you think for a minute that disaffiliation is kind of a harmless thing, um, yeah, young people, they don't care about religion. I'm not religious. I don't care about that. I, you know, As Charles Taylor pointed out you know, so powerfully, this is unique in the history of the human race, practically. Human beings from time immemorial have been religious. Now, we debate about what kind of religion and all that, but they've all been religious. They're all related to some transcendent mystery or some transcendent good. We're the first generation ever, ever, ever in human history that is saying, who cares? I'm indifferent to that. Now, there have always been, you know, the village atheists and all that, but but in great numbers, isn't it now like 40 or 50 percent of young people say, I have no religion. And we think that's going to have no effect. You're, You're running counter to this absolutely elemental human longing, and and you'll have no problem with that. Give me a break. I mean, that's that's repugnant to everything we know about the human person. So, no, I see them as deeply related to each other, disaffiliation and, and all this uh, uh, mental illness. During your presentation, you also lifted up Saint Dinfna, maybe not a household yeah. name, but she's the patron saint of those suffering from mental illness. Who was she? Tell us a little bit about her. You know, I, you're, you're catching me off guard there a bit because I, I forget some of the details. Um But she's the patroness, as you say, of people who are struggling with anxiety and with mental illness. Uh, The reason she's on my radar screen is as a bishop who confirms a lot of kids. The number, this is true in California, it's true now in Minnesota, the number of young girls who take the name Dymphna. And whenever they do, I think, yeah, it's someone who's struggling with anxiety or depression or mental illness. And, And the number of those choosing that name has increased. Now, that's very anecdotal on my part, but but I've noticed that. And it's um, not surprising, given these statistics. Let's close with this question. Uh, we talked about some ways that the church and the bishops in particular can help address this mental health crisis. What do you think Christ has to say to people listening to this who are struggling with their mental health or maybe have loved ones who are struggling with it? Come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Um, the ultimate doctor animarum is the Lord himself. And he comes as a healer. One of the most fundamental things we know about Jesus is he healed people who were sick and sick at all kinds of levels of life, even sickness unto death. But Jesus is a healer. He's soter is the, is the Greek word they used. Um, salvator that becomes in Latin. And we get savior from that. When you say Jesus Christ is my savior, you mean he's my healer. And so he's the ultimate source of healing at all levels of life. So I would say, you know, a prayerful surrender to him is indispensable in this process. 
And even if that, you know, I've, I've been counseling people for many, many years. And even if it's, oh, Father, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem to have any effect on me. Just do it. Just do it. I want you to go to church. I want you to spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. I want you to say, Lord, I hand my suffering and I hand my anxiety over to you. Um, it's not a magic formula, but it's such an important step. Um, and the Lord then will lead you. You know, if if you come to him, he'll say to you what he said to the person in the gospel. Do you want to be healed? That's, that's a very important thing because... It might seem obvious, but it's not. Do you want to be healed? Do you, do you want to find a way out of this? Well, come to me, all you who are burdened, and, and uh, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, right? So th that means yoke yourself to me. A yoke is always you know, joining two animals. Well, the one is yourself and the other is the Lord. Take my yoke upon your shoulders. So I, a relation to the Lord, it's indispensable here. Well, it's time now for a question from one of our listeners. If you have a question for Bishop Barron, send it in to us through the website askbishopbarron.com. Today we have a question from Brian in Kentucky. He is asking about the church's just war doctrine. Here hmm. it is. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Brian from Murrow, Kentucky. Um, my question is this. Is just war theory merely a concession to human weakness? Uh, because Isaiah does not say that we should beat our swords into plowshares unless the other guy attacks us first. Mm -hmm. And Christ doesn't say that we should turn the other cheek unless we really didn't deserve it, uh, so on and so forth. So can you justify just war theory for me? Thank you. Yeah, you're asking, a, of course, a big question. And I'll l let me say this. There is a very ancient and very strong and very important tradition of pacifism within Christianity. And, and you've cited some of the sources, both Old Testament and New, for that. And some of the church fathers, Origen comes to mind, would have taken basically a pacifist position. And it endures to this day. Think of a Dorothy Day. You know, um, Merton, I was going to say Merton, but Merton said he was not a pacifist. But there's a, a long and strong and venerable tradition along those lines. And it's because we are called to live, Colonel George used to put it this way, even now as we will all live with the Lord in heaven. You know, so think of uh, me as a, as a celibate. Uh, celibacy is not so much a privation. It's living even now as we will all live. When the Lord says, you know, in heaven, we're not going to marry or be given in marriage. So uh, pacifists today, seems to me, are a eschatological sign of how we will all live in heaven when we will indeed beat the swords and the plowshares and so on. Now, having said all that, go back to St. Augustine, and he's, he's echoed by Aquinas and almost the entire tradition. In our finite, fallen, conflictual world, sometimes, tragically, the only thing we can do to hold off certain gross forms of injustice is to take up arms or to engage in, in some sort of resistance. You know, you know, I always think, go from the, the big to the small here. It, you're committed to nonviolence and you're committed to love and enemy and all that. But you walk outside your home today and there's a, a woman being raped. There's a young kid being attacked. What do you do? I, I don't think you'd stage a nonviolent social protest at that point. You'd, I think, take pretty strong action. Now, it's sad, yeah, but that's the world we live in. Now, extrapolate from that to the grand scale, you know, so an entire nation now is being aggressed and being attacked. What do you do? Um, even as I honor the pacifist tradition, and I do, indeed, the nonviolent tradition, I, I would follow Augustine and the church here that sometimes in our finite, conflictual, sinful world, all you can do to hold off gross injustice is to engage in a limited, morally uh, conditioned um, uh, violence. So that's a quick answer to a really good and complex question you're raising. Well, as we wind to a close here, we are excited to announce the launch of yet another great book from Word on Fire. This one is being published through our Word on Fire academic line. It's titled Christ Brings All Newness, Essays, Reviews, and Reflections, and it's by Father Robert Imbelli. St. Irenaeus teaches that Christ brought all newness in bringing himself. 
This representative collection of the writings of Father Robert and Belly proclaims, celebrates, and sounds the depths of the newness of Jesus Christ, rooted in Scripture, the Fathers of the Church. These essays and reflections explore the Christian faith's rich liturgical, artistic, literary, and theological traditions across the centuries. Bishop, I know you've been a longtime friend and admirer of Father Mbeli. Tell us about him and why you think people might appreciate this book. Yeah, uh, he's a wonderful man. He's a priest of, of New York, but taught for many years at uh, Boston College. And he trained, I mean, a generation or two of, of theologians. I came across him very early on when I was just starting my kind of writing career. He read uh, something I'd written. I think it was just an article. And he was passing through Chicago, if I remember this right. And he reached out to me and said, I'd like to get together with you. And so we did. And I remember that we had a cup of coffee or something together. And he said, well, it seems like you you like to write. And you seem, you know, you, you're good at that. So you should continue. And it meant a lot to me uh, at that stage of my life and career. He encouraged me. But I've admired his work, I mean, for a long time. Uh, there's much I could say about it. It's a wonderful combination of the uh, the high academic and the spiritual, which is something I've always appreciated when you bring those different dimensions together. He's a great man for the church fathers and for Newman. And, and I, you know, cultivate those same interests. Something I really admire about him, and I've tried to follow in his footsteps, he's a man of the council. Uh, he was at Vatican II. I think he was a, a theology student during the years of the council. And he reverences the text of Vatican II. And accordingly, he doesn't like Catholic progressivism. And he doesn't like radical traditionalism. And I follow that path, that we are both great defenders of Vatican II, as it's been interpreted by the great post-conciliar popes. And I've laid that out, as you know, Brandon, as, you know, that's my position. That's what I'm for. And there are parties in the church today that have split on either side of that. And Bob and Belly is a good example, I think, of a very fine mind um, who walks that right path. And then, you know, he's in line there with Cardinal George, whom he reverenced, with Pope Benedict, whom he reverenced. So he, he kind of, he, I should say this further. I stand in the tradition that he has uh, stood in for a long time. 